Hey guys, do you love a good viral video? I totally do. And I was on Instagram a couple months ago and I saw a birth video that had been viewed over a million times, maybe like a couple million times. And I was like, whoa, what is this? And then I stalked the mom and it turns out we had like a million friends in common and she was from right around the corner from me. Her name's Kristen Huntsbett. And today she shares about that viral video and being a mom to seven tiny little humans. So today you're going to get a lot of birth stories wrapped up into one episode. Enjoy and have a fabulous week. What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does the day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hydes. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. Okay, before we get started, I just wanted to thank Anja of useanja.com for sponsoring this episode. If you did not catch my episode with Catherine Cross, who created the company Anja, I hope you'll rewind and listen all about cord blood banking with Use Anja. She is offering all Birth Story listeners $100 off their private cord blood banking with code BIRTHSTORY. Now, let me tell you a little personal story about Anja and private cord blood banking. I am a parent of a child with cerebral palsy. I did not know he was going to have cerebral palsy from a birth injury until after he was born. If I had chosen cord blood banking, the outcome of my child could be very different if he had access to his own stem cells. Those are blank cells that can go to repair and rewrite damaged cells, like in my son Jagger's with his brain injury. It can also be used with siblings. So cord blood banking, there's a 75% chance it will match with a sibling. There's a 50% chance it'll match with the parent. So yeah, like you, like if you get one of these 85 diseases that right now we know stem cells can help, that can help you too, not just your child and not just your child's siblings. You will be able to use the stem cells at some point So I don't want you to look at it as an insurance policy either. So I'm thinking like, oh, my five left knee surgeries. Like I could inject some stem cells in there at some point in the future and help my knee out. There's a lot of research and development going on with PCOS, hair loss, anti-aging, cancers, tumors, lymphomas, along with the 85 known diseases that we have already proven that stem cells can help to cure save lives, support lives and diseases. But what makes Anja different? Catherine Cross, her personal story, why she started Anja. There is a huge community. It is tech enabled. There's a beautiful brand that user experience is incredible. So like I said, if you do not know about cord blood banking, please rewind and listen to Catherine's episode. And if you decide to do cord blood banking, please use code BIRTHSTORY for $100 off at useanja.com, U-S-E-A-N-J-A.com. All right, here's your episode. Hi, Kristen. Welcome to the Birth Story Podcast. Hi, Heidi. Thank you for having me. I have Kristen Hunspet with me today, and 
I think all of you have seen her viral video on my Instagram and Instagrams for birth workers, you know, across social media. I found Kristen a couple of months ago when her birth video with her seventh child went viral. And I think it went viral for a couple of reasons, Kristen. But one, you were in a hospital and unattended, except with your partner by your side. Number two, you were really in control and super peaceful. So I'm really excited to hear about your birth story today and share it with everyone listening. But there's so much to you. So you guys, I started stalking Kristen on Instagram and I soon found out she lived right down the road in Davidson, North Carolina. And several of my dual clients were already going to see her business, Abode Wellness Lounge. So there's a lot to dig into, Kristen, and I just can't wait for this interview tonight. Thank you for being with me. Well, I'm so honored. Thank you for trusting me with your audience. And it is an interesting story. I'm actually shocked myself that it it happened the way that it did. <laughs> I can't wait to hear all the details. I mean, I have lots and lots and lots of questions. But okay. let's start with who Kristen is, right? So not sometimes we get on Instagram and we see this amazing photo or video and we never get the story behind the person. So I want to hear a little bit more about Kristen, you and your journey through parenthood and how you launched a business in the middle of a pandemic with seven children. So could you tell us all about yourself? Sure. Well, it, that sounds pretty amazing. But to be honest, I feel like just any other mom who's just trying to do her best. These are the opportunities that have been presented to me that I honestly don't see another way of being a mom other than living authentically as myself, because that's what I want my kids to do. For me, living authentically is doing what I'm passionate about, which is helping women who are struggling to conceive, helping every individual with more of like a lifestyle approach to wellness. And I didn't realize that in the process of wanting to offer that to other people that I was not actually doing it for myself. So that's actually what this past year has been teaching me on a very real level is how I needed to take care of my own mental and physical well-being while I'm trying to offer that very thing to everyone else. My birth story with Leon um, actually started, I might get emotional. It's okay. I, I found out I was pregnant this month, a year ago, and I was devastated um, to find out I was pregnant. And there's a lot of guilt around that because I love each and every one of my children so much. They're why I do everything that I do. And I thought I was at capacity that abode was my seventh baby, you know? Yeah. And then abode got shut down and I found out I was pregnant. <laughs> so it was really interesting, to be honest, the, the start of the pregnancy and everything was something I didn't realize how much I needed and how much I'm so very grateful to have been able to experience. So we found out we were pregnant with Leon and abode shut down. I was in full momentum of opening a business. We had a great soft opening. Then I was sick in my first trimester and dealing with a lot of really hard emotions. And um, my... Let me ask a quick question. Say, yeah. So abode was shut down in early 2020. Is that because of the pandemic? Yes. Mm -hmm. The pandemic hit after February 1st. February 1st is actually my grandmother's birthday who passed away two years ago. And it was just the perfect day for a soft opening. And um, we had amethyst crystals everywhere because that's her birthstone. <laughs> it was just really great. How so, long had you been working to build abode? Well, I've been a body worker for 11 years in August. It's been my whole career in the making to be able to present to the public a manual therapy approach to fertility and balancing hormones because it's amazing what we can do with our with our hands to help people 
Um, just when we introduce blood flow circulation, we introduce nutrients and hormone balance. And the body knows the blueprint. I've been pursuing fertility work for almost as long as I've been a body worker. So abode has been, it's been something that's come together through the 11 years of being a body worker. So there you are, 11 years of building something, pouring into other women, pouring into your family because you already had six beautiful children. And this, you know, you said what you thought was your seventh baby gets shut down. And there you are. How did you find out you were pregnant? Well, I had um, had one period since my sixth and it's just wild. I actually, we were going hiking in the mountains and I started my period. I really wanted to. It was just perfect. I was excited. I, was, I had my body back. I was going to get my cycle regulated, start to lose the baby weight. Then I ovulated two weeks late from that period. My husband did not get the vasectomy yet. <laughs> so that was something that we had been talking about and he hadn't gotten it and tell me not to have sex with him. And, and then I do. So, <laughs> so it would have been the day right before I started my period that I ovulated. And then I, I didn't obviously start my period. That's whenever we conceived Leon was a day before I was supposed to start my period because I ovulated two weeks late. Okay. Do you feel yeah. conception? Yes, I knew right away. I knew. I remember yeah. the next morning after I got pregnant, we were eating grits <laughs> and I looked at my husband and I was like, so I'm pregnant. Like I, we, I got pregnant <laughs> I like, last, like last yesterday. And he was like, well, you were a crazy person. <laughs> and I was wow. like, I was like, no, I'm pregnant. I can feel it. Everything in my body is different today. That was wow. with my first, with my second, I wasn't as in tune. I don't think because I had a five month old and I was still nursing and I just don't remember feeling it. But the first I did, I was just a few first wow. few minutes of speaking to you, Kristen. I'm like, I bet she just felt her conception. She knew. <laughs> Well, you were right. Yes. That's so interesting that you asked that because I've never been asked that before. But yeah. So you felt your conception. You knew there was number seven on the way. You know, I want to just reach through and give you a hug because I hear all that emotion, right? Like, have you had this plan and you had this business and it was you time and there's a new surrender, right? A full yeah. surrender that had to occur over the course of that pregnancy. And so many people listening today, maybe they're even pregnant with number one and it was unexpected. And so whether it's one, two, three, I mean, many of us have this moment of that wasn't really what I was planning for. Mm. So yeah. That and, and that guilt of, of like the first few weeks or even months of, you know, I'm, everything I do, live, breathe, eat is for my kids. And they saved my life. <laughs> and just to think that for a second, that the seventh baby, that I didn't have a place in my heart for him, or at least that's what I thought it was and still is devastating to me. But clearly, you know, I live every day for him too. And I'm just so grateful that he joined our family and that we get to be his and that he gets to be ours. Yeah. So when... When do you think, at what point in your pregnancy did kind of your mindset shift to that surrender? I know there was a time, you know, I can't say definitively an exact day. I know there was a shift in mindset. I think it was that I didn't feel capable or worthy of him because I had those feelings and it put me in a very negative momentum. Once I started to feel worthy of him again, we just fell in love, you know, we couldn't even from, you know, feeling his first kicks, we just fell completely in love. Actually, I can tell you the exact day. Okay. Let me just rewind a little bit. Okay. It was Easter because we told the kids. And as soon as the kids started getting excited and learned of him, then I felt like they could, their excitement could carry me through, you know, that was what changed. Changed everything. I just got goosebumps hearing that. Oh. I'm glad you asked me that because it brought me back to that moment. And I and it kind of 
you know, just after everything that happened with his birth, I, I have forgotten about those very precious moments that things did start to change. Are you a Christian? I do believe in Jesus. Yeah, I was raised as a Christian, and um, the past 10 years I've been deconstructing from some of the ways that were used to break me using the Bible. So I've actually just recently been open to reading the Bible again in a different light because my kids are Christians. (laughs) So, you know, they love church and they love the Bible. So I'm trying to be sensitive to their innocence in in learning about the Lord. And in doing that, I do feel like I'm healing from the abuse. Yeah. I interviewed, I have another podcast called Thanks. It's the trauma podcast. And I, (laughs) I recently interviewed the founder of purityculturedropout.com. And you're kidding. No. I need to listen. Oh my gosh, I have goosebumps. It was uh, really interesting. So uh, I won't make you go into that part of your life's journey and life story, but I had asked the question though, because it was on Easter. And so what symbolism I feel like, you know, with just the, you know, even in the Christian text of just like the surrender of Jesus and then the rising. And so, you know, it kind of sounds like for me, I just was like, oh, that's so symbolic for the day, for Easter day, you know, of just uh, leaving, wow. leaving that behind and rising, a uh, rising away and arising out of it. So whether you're Christian or not oh, listening to the podcast, I think it's a good, good symbolism there. Thank you for thinking of that. That's really beautiful. So Kristen, tell me a little bit about how your husband was feeling about having a seventh. I'm so glad that you asked that. I was having a really hard day. And this is going to make me sound very superficial, but there might be some people who can relate. I'd finally gotten a mom band that I just loved. <laughs> and it's um, it's a Mercedes Metris. I totally recommend it. And it's about the same price as a regular minivan. (laughs) So it's like such a cool van. I love it. It just fits everybody. It's tall enough for the big ones, small enough for the littles. It was a (laughs) eight-seater. I just couldn't figure out how we were going to fit all of the kids into the van. You know, it's just kind of like that little thing that weighs on your mind that's just like the fruit of something much bigger. I was my highest weight that I had been. And I was just about to lose all of my baby weight. And that's another thing I'm very embarrassed about because I'm very body positive. I have four daughters, but in reality, I've always dealt with an an eating disorder from my teenage years. And um, it doesn't look like it from the outside, but I've been struggling to, to have control in my life with my weight and with other things. And it just manifests sometimes in an eating disorder, but it had not come back until last year, around the time that I found out I was pregnant. I do think that the idea of control and the eating disorder were just coming in tandem and knowing I wasn't going to lose that baby weight, but I was actually going to gain more. And so I walked outside to my husband and I just expressed all of my, all of the things that were weighing on my heart. And he said, you carry the baby and I'll carry you. And he just hugged me. And um, I'll never forget that feeling of just feeling like that this was going to be okay. It was going to, everything was going to work out. And a little did I know how much he was going to need to carry me because it actually ended up being the most challenging pregnancy I've had. Um, I, my life was in jeopardy. His life was in jeopardy which is why instead of having a home birth like we normally would have or a birth center birth, we ended up being high risk. Why? What was, um, tell me about your pregnancy. What was high risk? As I was getting dual care with the birth center and with my midwife, which was difficult to do because it was during the pandemic. So I would go to the midwife and I went to the birth center, but it was just really choppy. Anyway, in the process of learning that I had gestational hypertension. I was in a high-risk hospital because I had a blood pressure spike on September 29th. And the blood pressure spike was so high that I needed to stay overnight for being monitoring. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
so because it was in the middle of a pandemic and I was doing dual care with the midwife and the, the home, midwife at the birth center and the home birth midwife, whenever I was with the home birth midwife, she noticed that my blood pressure was a little bit high. And so what I would normally have done is take supplements, change my diet and go on walks. And that usually would take care of it. But this time I actually had a blood pressure spike between week 31 and week 32. The midwife at the birth center, she was texting with me and she said that was too high and to go to the nearest hospital where they had a NICU. So the nearest hospital that they had a NICU was in Uptown. And when she said that, I just started crying. I just started getting really scared and which was also a precious moment because this baby that I was surprised about that I that I felt guilty for not wanting to be pregnant and all of a sudden the risk of him needing to be in the NICU was just too much you know cuz we were so excited to have him and and then the feelings of unworthiness and now we might not get him it was just I just didn't understand what was unfolding and I was always having you know I would always go over with my babies. So this was just an unusual experience. He was moving a lot, but my blood pressure was just so high. And so I went to the hospital and they monitored me overnight. When I found out that they were going to need to transfer me to high risk, I didn't really know how to process that because I would need to be seen two times a week up until I had the baby. And they would likely, likely need to induce me. So this was, these were all things that I was just not used to. Pretty soon after they told me, I just understood that that was the process. This was something that needed to happen, that I needed empathy or just for whatever reason, this was going to be our story. And um, with all natural births and home births where I catch my own baby and all of the things, um, now I was going to have a high risk hospital birth. It was just a different, it was just a different place to be in, especially at 31 and 32 weeks and not, and to not know what, you know, the next few weeks were going to look like. So what was your diagnosis? Ultimately, it ended up turning into postpartum preeclampsia. And it started as gestational hypertension? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for the audience listening, there is a difference between gestational hypertension, which is elevated blood pressure. There's a lot of criteria that goes behind it, but it's typically if your top number is around above 150 and your bottom number is above 90 and you have two of those readings and something like four hours or and then another Mm -hmm. week apart, we get an official diagnosis of gestational hypertension that's different than pre-E or pre-eclampsia where there's protein in your urine and, and different markers but it can often lead into what Kristen's talking about, which is postpartum preeclampsia. And eclampsia means seizure, so a pre-seizure state. So very scary. And so they weren't going to let you go home. That's correct. And they had talked about inducing me within even those weeks if it had stayed high. Thankfully, through being monitored, it wasn't going as high as it was whenever I was admitted. But what would happen is it would spike in the middle of the night. I would call the ambulance and I have multiple times in the middle of the night with a high blood pressure. And um, And what were your symptoms, Kristen? I would wake up with my heart just beating like out of my chest and my hands were cold and clammy. The baby would be moving fine sometimes a little too much is what I was thinking, but they said that, you know, if he's moving, then that's good. Any blurred vision or dizziness? I had spotting in my visit, in my vision, and then also some dizziness. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And just seeing different spots and things. Yeah. Yeah. I want to just... Shortness of breath was a big one and terrible heartburn, but because I had heartburn anyway... I didn't correlate the two, but it ended up being one of those symptoms. And so your previous six pregnancies, this was not the case. So this was all new with Leon. Yes, exactly. It was, it was all new. I might've had like a little bit of high blood pressure with the others, but it was all manageable. So now you're 31 and a half weeks and you're 
hospitalized. (laughs) I mean, in the middle of a pandemic, I cannot think of anything more excruciating, to be honest. Yeah, you you know what made it harder was I had not been talking with my mom because I needed to just go inward. And we were having some challenging, just having some strain on our relationship. And I really love my mom. And she's such a good person. I just needed to preserve my energy because I don't get along with my stepdad. So while I was in the hospital, it was the full moon. And I get a phone call that my brother had third degree burns and he was in the emergency room, Mississippi. And my mom was in a partial coma in Concord and um, she had um, ketoacidosis. And we were not even sure that she had um, diabetes, but she was in coma. So on the full moon, all three of us, we just were, we were all in the emergency room and been admitted. Well, that's enough to make your blood pressure go crazy. (laughs) You know, what was wild is they let me go so I could go see my mom. And I was the only one who's going to be allowed to see my mom in the emergency room. I didn't know if I was ever going to see her again, to be honest, because she was in such a bad state. Thankfully, she pulled through. But that's actually what brought us back together. We've been talking ever since. But man, it was hard. (laughs) How's your brother? He's doing good. I saw him a few weeks ago. He came up for a visit and his burns look, they've all, he's all recovered. So it's just crazy how sometimes things all happen at once. I was not on talking terms with my brother or my mom. Now we're all talking. So I don't even know what to make of that, honestly. I mean, I think it's really beautiful. And I often, and this is something that I say a lot on my other podcast, on the trauma podcast, is like my traumas tend to all like come all together all at once too. And I've had so many like fall to my knees moments where I am just like, God, I don't understand what you're doing to me. I'm like, I thought you broke me in a million pieces, but then you broke me in two million and then you broke me in 10 million. It's like, when are you going to stop breaking me, you know? So I totally get that feeling of like, I can just tap into that, what you were feeling that night at the hospital on the full moon. And it's just like, Mm. someone let me take a breath. Just exactly. You know, a phrase I've been saying quite a lot during that time was I just can't, my heart is broken. And it's so strange that it ended up being my heart. I just want to give you a big hug. You're okay. One of the reasons I love doing this podcast, Kristen, is because sometimes we need to release. Sometimes we hold things inside that we don't even know we're holding in about our birth experiences and our traumas. And sometimes just talking through them just releases it. And it lets you have a thank you. Friday night. So much happened after the birth that like I haven't really processed some of this. Like I was observing and taking it in and seeing the synchronicities, but just being on the side of it is like seeing more of the picture, you know? Yeah. It's overwhelming. Yeah. But you're here and you survived it. And you did it. And your business abode is open. Yes. And your mom and you are connected. And your brother survived. And your husband carried you. He sure did. Oh, my word. Yeah. The story is so long. I'm sorry. No, I love every minute of it. And I am beyond excited to share because this platform is storytelling and you're a beautiful storyteller. And so we're going to take our time while you process and share because we're just thankful to receive it. It takes a lot of energy and effort to tell. And so everyone listening right now is just happy to receive the beautiful words and experience that you have to give to us so that we can learn something from you. Thank you. So take me back to that hospital room after the full moon. 
You said they let you go to see your mom. Did you have to come back? I didn't for a little while. And I had been seeing the high-risk OB twice a week to make sure that the baby was okay and that I was okay. And my blood pressures were always fine during the day. And then at night they would just spike. So it was very scary because no one was open. The only thing I could do, I couldn't drive and I couldn't leave. My husband couldn't leave the children. So I I would have to call the ambulance. And go alone? Yes. Mm -hmm. I do remember thinking that the drive was very stressful to try and get a babysitter going all the way into uptown. We would do a fetal monitoring to make sure that the baby, the non-stress test for the baby. Whenever I had my last visit, they scheduled the induction and I had never been induced before. I was um, interested to see how, how that would go because I typically, my water will break and I'll have the baby within a couple hours. I didn't know how it would go being induced at 37 weeks, but because I had had the six births, I just assumed it would go really fast. And, and, and to be honest, I, I was uh, fully aware that I could have ended up with a cesarean as well, because with inducing at 37 weeks and having hypertension, the baby could have gone into distress and then, you know, who knows how it would have turned out. So I just, we scheduled that appointment knowing that, you know, we're just doing the right thing for the baby and for me. I've always been pro necessary medical intervention, and this was necessary. You know, in the past, I, you know, I had my first baby at home. The hospital was around the corner that put me at ease. And I just knew with her that if I was, if I was home and comfortable, that she was going to be born quickly and, you know, that it was going to work out. And so she actually was born very quickly. My second one was in Norway. My second birth was in Norway with my now, she'll be 11 years old in August. And that was with a a midwife at a birth center in Norway. It was a great experience. It was actually a hospital, but it's worked. It operates like a birth center because they only have midwives. And that was a really great experience. So I just, I've had four home births and two birth center births. And this was just a different rodeo. (laughs) So. Will you take all of us through, so one was at home, two was Norway birth center. Will you tell me about three, four, five, and six really quick? (laughs) Well, um, luckily they were very fast. So it actually is not going to be very long (laughs) to tell you about them. (laughs) Number three, he was born at home. I had a little bit of perdermal labor with him and the amazing midwife came all the way. She lived at least 45 minutes away, if not an hour. She came all the way there in the middle of the night, went all the way home and came back the next day. She's amazing. With his birth, I had something, it's like an autoimmune disorder where I have a lot of flare-ups in my third trimester. So I had that going on, but the birth itself was just amazing. Um, He was born very quickly and my husband and I caught him. He was born in the water. With my fourth, she was OP and she was born at home. And I had to talk her out. And she, her birth was actually almost identical to Leon's birth in the way that he was OP and she was OP. Wow. And had I not had that experience with Sylvia, I can't imagine having Leon in the hospital with an OP birth. I mean, she prepared me for sure. And she was born sunny side up and she's just such a, such a sweet person. And OP births really make me think about how there can be a situation that's just not optimal and you can still have a beautiful outcome. And I feel like that's what OP births taught me because I'm always with body work. I'm always, let's get this baby at the perfect presentation. And sometimes that's just not the option. You have to expand into it. And I just remember my back needing to expand with Sylvia. I was felt like I was being crushed. And I just, I felt if I do not expand my back, She's not coming out. And before her birth, I didn't even, I really didn't know how babies got stuck because my babies would just come out so quickly. But then I had Sylvia and (laughs) she could have very easily been stuck if I was not in the perfect position, leaning forward on my knees and talking her out. And I just had to keep telling myself during every contraction, it's okay. It's okay. 
this is okay. <laughs> and mm-hmm. you're doing it, baby. You're doing it. The midwives were just amazing. And they just let me do the most primal thing, which was just get on my hands and knees and talk that baby out. It just, it was amazing. I, I do remember thinking if the sun comes up, then I'm going to freak out, but <laughs> it didn't. So mm-hmm. there, born. there are some cultures that believe the brief, the breach presentation and the OP presentation and in call, like these are very special babies and that they are choosing wow. like with breach, they say they're choosing to be upright. They're choosing to stand tall. And with OP, <gasps> they're choosing to show you that they know how to do things a little differently. Oh my God. That's amazing. I've never heard that. So I don't know about the personalities with number four oh, yes. and number seven, but they'll find a way, right? They persevere. Oh. They find a way, they're fighters, they're tough, and that they can work their way through any situation. Oh my word, Heidi, that just speaks so perfectly to both of the seasons that we were in with both babies. That's wild. Mm -hmm. Yep. I could write a whole book on (laughs) what your baby looks like when they come out and what that tells you a little bit about them. (gasps) Oh, I love that. That I would just love to hear more about that. It's amazing. So tell me about five and six. Okay. So um, like you said, you know, you know, whenever you're pregnant, I knew when I was pregnant, we tried with number five. We, we did every, we had to do this shuttles method. So we had, we wanted to have a brother. We had three beautiful girls and a little boy. We wanted to have a brother for him. We did the shuttles method and sure enough, we got Ezra. Tell everybody about this method. Oh, well, so it's whenever you have sex at a specific time during and before ovulation to try for a girl or a boy. But it was really wild because after Sylvia, I said, we're not going to have any more children. (laughs) (laughs) We can adopt. And my daughter, she came up to me a day or two after I had him. And she said, you're going to have another baby and it's going to be a little boy. I said, no, I'm not. Because <laughs> after you have an OP baby, it's just like, it's a whole different ball game. Like recovery and everything is just different. And I opened the Bible and I landed on the word, the name Japheth. And I looked up the meaning of Japheth and it means to expand, expand your territory, like to expand. Yeah. So I thought, okay, well, if we do, you know, we can use that in his name. When I was pregnant with Ezra, this is our fifth. When I was pregnant with him, I didn't know it was a boy. We had tried using the shuttles method and I was taking a bath and thought, you know, Lord, give me a name for him or give me a name for this baby. And the name Ezra came to mind. So I looked up the meaning of Ezra and it says helper. The name means helper. So in my heart, it means you can expand your territory and the Lord will help you. Or it, what does it mean? Expand. Japheth means to expand. When I got pregnant with Sylvia, we just couldn't figure out a name. And then one day the name Sylvia came to me and it means out of the forest. Oh, wow. And then her middle name is Eden. So to me, it just went back to like the original intent that the Lord had of covering, you know, we went from the garden of Eden to Cain and Abel, where the Bible says they'll have to work by the sweat of their brow, you know? Yeah. And then when Jesus comes, he came with love and covering and we get the redemption that is, you know, yeah. So Sylvia Eden and then um, Ezra, our helper. So we felt like we were being expanded and that we would be helped through Ezra. That's kind of his story. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah. it. And then number six, who's number six? That's Florence Meadow. What great name. And, um, so her, her name means Blossoming Meadow. And we just felt like at that time that, that we were blossoming, that we were able to steward what we had and, and blossom and We thought we were done. Tell me a little bit about her birth. So Florence, we we were not crazy about where we were living. We moved to five acres and we wanted to build a house or restore the 1860s farmhouse on the property. 
But because we didn't want to have a home birth in the house, the other house that we're living in, we decided to go to the birth center. I was 39 weeks. I just, I, I think I turned to 40 weeks in a few days over. And this is how it gets when you have multiples. It's not down to the hour anymore. <laughs> it's down to like the week. So I just remember taking a nap on the couch and my water broke. I called the midwife, called my mom. And I said, you know, normally I'll have the baby within a couple hours after my water breaks. And sure enough, like we get in the car, the contractions pick up. I'm yelling at my husband to get to the, like to run the red lights and everything. He wasn't running the red lights. And so I was getting really pissed. The contract, I started like thinking, oh no, we're going to have her on the side of the road. And I called the midwife and she said that the pool was getting ready. So I just told her, I'm like, if I need to have the baby in the foyer, that's okay. I'm okay with that. So we we get to the birth center. I get into the water. Things slow down a little bit, but I had her within within the hour of arriving. And um, I caught her and she just was so perfect. I just remember having so much joy. And her birth was just so, it was just so peaceful. And I want to say effortless, but it was it was really... Uh, we, we can get into this with Leon's birth, but with every single birth, the self-talk is just, it's where I have my strength is just talking through the contractions and not being surprised. <laughs> That's really important for me. And I love that you said self-talk too, because remember you were saying like with your fourth that you were like, I had to talk her out. I was at a home birth last week and it was a mom who was doing a home birth after cesarean. And wow. she had just, we had, I had been there over 30 hours and the midwives had been there, I think for 20 hours. And it was, you know, she just was getting really tired and she just came out of the room and said, is this ever going to happen? And I could just tell she was kind of, you know, getting scared and afraid it was taking too long. And so I said, come for a walk with me. I don't even know. It was probably the middle of the morning or something. And we wow. walked to the bottom of the driveway and she lives up on like the side of like a big, I'm not going to call it a mountain, but like a big hill. And we get to the bottom of the driveway and I said, okay, we're going to, you need to talk to her right now. So I started talking to her baby for her just to get wow. the hang of it. But I was like, you need to tell her it's time. Like you've done the work. It's now it's her time, right? It's her turn to join us, wow. right? Like mommy has done all of this hard work and you just have to talk to her. You have to tell her it's safe. And um, mm. we walked up that really steep hill while she talked and cried and released. And we went inside and she was ready to push. <laughs> oh my so, word, Heidi. What? That is where the magic is. Yeah. I mean, sometimes this self-talk, what we say to ourselves in birth, what we say to our babies in birth, it really helps their timing, you know, that we're connected to them in that way. So I believe that um, even before someone conceives, I believe that just creating that space and talking to their body and welcoming their baby into their, their life. Yep. It's really important. I mean, down to like, I know you do fertility work and fertility massage and all things to help the women to support their family planning and their heal their womb space and get rid of the trauma in their womb space. And I love all the work that you do, but so much too is just breath work, just breathing yeah. into our <laughs> womb. Yes. Like, Rem it's like beautiful. noticing that we have a womb and breathing into it and touching mm. it and acknowledging it. I mean, yes, we can get a lot with fertility with like, you know, oh, your high risk it. doctor and so, your fertility yes. meds and all that. So I don't want to downplay like the fact that like many of us need to have IVF and IUI and different things like that. But just like baseline, first line of defense, I think is just really opening up your womb space with breath and with talk and acknowledgement. So that's beautiful. Yes. I do see IVF as the cesarean of fertility, which is necessary medical intervention. 
And last, usually it's the last thing. Sometimes people say, just skip ahead. I'm 40 years old, you know, skip mm-hmm. ahead to that. And that's their starting point. But a lot of times we, you know, start here, move there, go there, come to abode, get some healing. Yeah. Everybody has their journey. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm just breaking in for just a minute in case you forgot the code. So the code is birthstory at useanja.com for $100 off if you choose to privately bank your cord blood and tissue with Anja. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back to the story. So I heard you say water birth, water birth, but that was just for two of them. Did you birth all of your first six in the water? My firstborn was in the water. My second was, it was um, actually on my back. She was coming so fast. I just pushed her out on my back. My third was in the water. Fourth was on my knees and out of the water. Fifth was in the water. His birth was really fast. I had Indian food. My water broke. He was out. I wanted to just give you a chance to take a break and a little breath and just kind of have a, just a memory and an, I don't know, just give this podcast an opportunity to memorialize some of their stories too. But I want to come back to Leon and I want to come back to you were having to go back and forth in the middle of the night by ambulance alone. And then they decided they're going to induce at 37 weeks for the safety of both of you. So did they bring you in at night or in the morning? So this is where it gets very interesting. I had been working in my second trimester at Abode and um, just so grateful to be able to work. It helped me move around because at home I would just be sitting down a lot of times just to rest, but it actually was a state of mild depression, to be honest. And so getting up, going to work, getting dressed, taking a shower, and also being able to be part of Abode's growth. We had our opening month and we exceeded all of our goals. That was in July. So we were in full celebration and opening mode. I had wound down work as much as I could. Each of the fertility treatments are about six weeks at a time. So I was just wrapping every every one of them up and getting ready to have the baby, monitoring my blood pressure, doing the non-stress test. And then I remember starting to have a little desire for the birth and starting to visualize it. Well, I had spoken with one of our clients here and she said that she really liked a specific hospital that happened to be closer to where we live. And this drive to Uptown was just really weighing on me, especially if I was going to go into labor, potentially not make it to the hospital. That was really stressful if I had gone into preterm labor. So the appointment was on Sunday. And I remember starting to ask a few of my friends and my sister, have you ever heard of an unassisted hospital birth? So this was fully premeditated, just full disclosure. Okay. (laughs) Um, So I started to ask if they had heard of an unassisted hospital birth. And they said, yeah, that's unlikely. And I had been in many hospital births and I knew that it was slim to none, that I was going to be able to get that experience. But I just started to feel like that's what needed to happen. So I thought, if I'm going to go to Uptown, I probably will be monitored very closely and I'll be induced and that's just not going to happen. If I'm going to have an unassisted hospital birth, I'll probably need to go to this closer hospital and be monitored there during labor. So the only way that that was going to happen is if my water broke prematurely. So in my mind, I thought if my water broke on Friday or before I go into the hospital, then I'll go to this hospital and they have midwives there. I think that would be a good experience because my client really enjoyed her experience there versus her experience at the hospital in Uptown. I just had it all in my mind and was fully prepared to be disappointed. (laughs) 
<laughs> but what happened was on Thursday night, I go to, I, I'd actually been up with my husband and I said, you know what? I just feel like he's lower. And I have this weird feeling down here above my pubic bone. It just feels like a pool. He said, yeah, you definitely look lower. I said, well, that's good. Cause I'm going to be induced on Sunday. At least he's getting engaged probably. You know, we're just kind of talking through it and I go to sleep and just after 12 o'clock, I woke up to my water breaking. Yep. <laughs> and so we called the hospital because I, I didn't know if we were going to be able to make it to, we called the hospital and we called the ambulance because I didn't know if my mom was going to make it to the house to watch the kids in time. So the ambulance comes. I said, my water has broken prematurely. I need to get to the hospital because my baby, I don't know if he's going to be okay. So you decide in that moment, you like, we're going to the the closer hospital. Yeah. So yeah. this is wild because my water broke and that was the only way I was going to be able to go to this hospital with the midwives that were recommended by my client. Okay. So they could and go with you. Who could like, go with me? So could your midwives go with you? Or were no, you they just couldn't, but they they just had a good reputation. <laughs> so, oh, okay. And scratch that. And so you mean you were going to the hospital where midwives worked that yes, you hadn't yeah. yet met? So I went to the local the closest hospital and I show up and I said, My water has broken and I'm preterm. I'm thirty six and a half weeks. The young woman who was wheeling me to the elevator, I told her that they were, she was asking questions and I told her that this was my seventh baby. And she said she was one of seven. So I just started crying because I felt like I'm in the right place. Mm -hmm. I start out by getting a COVID test and they hooked me up to the monitors. And they said they have to wait two hours for the test to come back. And I said, well, I normally have my babies within two hours. And at this time, my contractions were actually kind of subsiding which was very confusing to me. But I said, you know, once I get settled in, they're just going to kick in and he's going to come out. They just started to continue getting me checked in and the test came back negative. So they brought me to a room. And at this time it had gone past the two hour mark, the three hour mark. They were trying to get his heartbeat and they were trying to monitor me. And as the time kept going by, I realized that this labor was going to be different, that he had not come within two hours and they're not able to monitor me very effectively. The monitor alarms were going off pretty consistently, which is very stressful. I remember a, a shift whenever we went from the initial room where I had to be tested negative for COVID, where I had to receive the negative test for COVID. And then to the room that was the birthing room, I thought maybe this is what I was waiting for. And now I'll have the baby. Well, I was introduced to the new midwife and she was amazing. I loved her right away and to the nurse. And I just knew that this was going to be the team that would help me welcome the baby. The nurse let me walk around. She had been in, she had been in the profession for 30 years and that just made me feel so safe that she did not have any agenda or expectations for this birth. She was just simply there to support me. And she was an angel. And it, what was really neat is before they, they actually had to start me on Pitocin and I had never been on Pitocin. So she was very gentle with me. And she said she would start low, but she noticed that I had not eaten since the day before at four o'clock because with the type of heartburn I was having, if I had eaten past four or five, I would just be in so much pain. So she brought me a meal. My husband brought me a meal and I, I just ate until I was full. And then they started me on Pitocin a little while after that. So she started me very low. How was your blood pressure during labor? It was good. There was a few subtle elevated blood pressures, but it, it was nothing like what it would be in the middle of the night. So it was morning time and it stayed really well, actually. And even after I had him, it went down very low and went, was very healthy. It was wild. Isn't your body so smart, Kristen, that your water broke because yes. you were having these blood pressure spikes? 
So your body took you all the way to the highest point that it needed to go for Leon to be safe. And then your body released your waters because you visioned it. And because your body knew that there was an environment inside of you where Leon may be safer on the outside than on the inside and that you may be safer being with a baby in your arms rather than in your womb. I just think it's so fascinating that your water broke. Of course your water broke, you know? Isn't that wild? Yeah, happens all the time. The story happens Mm -hmm. all the time. My moms will say, hey, Heidi, you know, they want to induce my, I'm at the hospital right now. My blood pressure is a little high and I'm like, go home. Your water's going to break tonight. <laughs> like your yeah. body is going to, if your body is in a heightened state, you're, you're going to go into labor and they do, you know, if they get, if it's they so have patients perfect. like you had. Yeah. I mean, it's wonderful. So you're in this hospital room and hours are going by and you're like, what is going on? on here. I'm in a, I'm, you're in a place you've never been before emotionally, physically, and like locationally. Right. So what did you do? Like, what were the next steps to have like set up that room for an unassisted birth? Well, I started thinking maybe if I go use the restroom, you know, and have the baby in there, I needed my sacred space where I didn't feel observed. And I thought, well, maybe if I'm going to the restroom, then that'll be a good place. But what started to happen, because I was just a few days shy of 37 weeks, they couldn't take me off of the monitor um, because having been a massage labor support doula for a period of time, I knew that I had the right to get taken off of the monitor. But because I was just a few days short, of being to term, then they weren't really allowing me to. And I understood why. And I appreciated them. And it actually started pointing me towards what I would need to understand that the baby was actually OP. And that's why I was not going into full labor. That's why he didn't come so early, so soon after my water broke, because he was head up, head face up, because he was face up. So I started to, you know, lean forward on the ball. I would have a few strong contractions, um, but they weren't very consistent. He wasn't engaged yet. So the midwife came in. I said, he's OP. These monitors are blaring. It's, it's, I'm trying to cope and I can't because like, I didn't say I couldn't cope, but I, I was just telling her I'm trying to cope. And she said, okay, hands and knees. I said, no, I'm going to stay right here. I'm just going to have the baby right here. It's okay. <laughs> so I'm going to have the baby right here. And she's like, okay, well, I'll be back. Let me know whenever she's getting pushy. The midwife came around again and they're trying to like, you know, the little sandpaper to get my skin to stick to the, the mobile monitor. Oh, yep. The, yep. It's so called trying the to Novi. Do that. I'm going to, oh, this is a really good thing for me to, to teach on. So the, sure. the, mo- the portable monitor, the wireless monitor that Kristen's talking about, it's called like the Novi or the Monica. And they have to like scratch up your belly really hard to get the monitor to stick. But then you can be continuously monitored without like all of the wires and straps. And, you know, it's just like a cute little sticker that looks like a flower that goes right across your belly button. So they were scratching up your belly annoying you, keeping you from your labor (laughs) progressing. (laughs) It was so interesting because they were absolutely the most perfect team. I was at the hospital that I wanted to be at, and yet I wasn't going into full-fledged labor. And I just knew I was going to turn a corner eventually. It just had that feeling. But when the monitor started blaring and they couldn't allow me to walk around, because I needed to be monitored. They said, okay, you can be on your back for 20 minutes monitored, and then you can get up and walk around. So what I said is that because the baby's OP, I'm not going to be able to stay on my back. (laughs) I'm going to have to be sitting up and you're not going to be able to get his back because his back is that way. (laughs) It's just not going to work. They were just so understanding and kind. I said, can you just give me a couple hours without the monitor and come and and come and check on them. But they had so many births that they were not able to do that for me. And I understand. 
So she went to go ask the midwife and I hope it didn't sound awful, but I was like, just take your time (laughs) because at that moment I had been able to get most of the monitors off and they, they actually by off, I mean, they turned them off for me. So they weren't blaring, you know, Yeah, they were still able to observe from their desk, but the sirens had stopped like right next to my head. So I was leaning forward. I had a few strong contractions. The nurse said that she would just go monitor outside to call her whenever, you know, I needed her. And so I just remember breathing through the contractions and as they started getting stronger and I started to just say, thank you. I'm so grateful. I am so grateful. So grateful. And as they got stronger and stronger, I I am so thankful. Now I was in the place I wanted to be and the baby was healthy and I was healthy and I just was so grateful. And that's just what I kept saying to myself. That was my mantra. I am so grateful. And as they got stronger and came on stronger, I said, I am not surprised. I am not surprised. This is not surprising me. Nothing is surprising me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And um, that was really important for me because the feeling in labor sometimes can be so strong. And I think the feeling of being surprised makes my body tense up. So to think to myself that I'm grateful and that nothing is going to surprise me made me be able to realize that she was not, he was not quite engaged. And that I needed to push him past my sacrum and past my pubic bone. And it got to the point where I I checked myself to see how far I was dilated. And I was dilated, but I could not feel his head. And I wasn't able to articulate that to my husband because I was in a little bit of denial that I was that far into labor. Even on Pitocin, my water had broke and I could not feel his head. And so... During a very hard contraction, I got into the position that I needed to get into and I bore down and I could feel him descend right into my lower back. And it just felt so like so much like expansion in my pelvis needed to happen. It just was like he was right there at my lower back and it just he didn't go past my lower back during that push, but I could feel him getting engaged, you know? And so then another contraction came and I just pushed so hard and I felt his head like literally like rotate around my pubic bone, like a ball, just like go around my pubic bone and then get right there for the next push. And he, he was out. (laughs) He was, just so perfect and so amazing. And I feel like most of his birth happened in those last few minutes. Like he was not engaged until those last few contractions. Yeah. And I love that you pushed instinctually. We often talk about like waiting for this fetal ejection reflex. And Mm. there's so much to be said for a mother's intuition. If you can tap into that, I wanted to push my baby out at seven centimeters. Like I, and I remember apologizing, saying like, I'm so sorry. And my midwife said to me, Heidi, your body would never let you hurt itself. Oh, I love that. And it gave me permission to push at seven centimeters. And I pushed the head down into the cervix and then the cervix disappeared, but it needed (laughs) me to To dilate. To dilate, yeah. And then that expulsive fetal ejection reflex came, but I am hearing your story and I'm thinking that's it. It's that innate wisdom, that internal talk, that universe. Like there's, if we are quiet and we are undisturbed and we are mammals and we are safe and we are dark, we can hear the messages that our body is sending to us. And how amazing. So this video has gone viral. It's unbelievable. This is like, must be the last push or two that you just described. And Mm. your husband is so cute, swaying back and forth. And (laughs) there's like a GoPro or something. (laughs) Like, when did you say, like, turn on the camera? (laughs) The baby's coming. (laughs) 
I thought, you know, my one of my best friends is a professional videographer and photographer. And part of the experience this time was that I wasn't going to have, you know, my best friend there. And, you know, I thought she'll want to see the birth. My sister will want to, my mom will. And if I do get this unassisted hospital birth, like, you know, at least I'll have it on film to show the kids. My daughter actually was at my last birth as well. And I always show my kids my birth videos and they're always very much a part of birth. So that was one of the reasons why I had it up. So had it been filming the whole time? It was about 30. I don't remember exactly how many minutes were actually on film, but because he was OP, I didn't know at what point he was actually going to come. Um, so yeah, that's the last few minutes, really seconds of the birth. Oh, amazing. I was just thinking you were so internal. Like when would you have opened your eyes and said, hey, turn on the camera. So it makes more sense to me that it was, had been rolling for 30 minutes or so. So Leon comes out and how long are you, tell me about those moments, like after he's born, like how long are you alone? Crying, laughing, staring at each other, like, whoa. <laughs> Tell me. It was me amazing. About it. So he came out and my husband said, Oh, get the nurse. And I said, No, come get the baby. And so he picks up the baby and he hands him to me. And then he goes and he washes his hands. It's so funny because he didn't wash his hands to touch the baby. He washed his hands because he had touched the baby. <laughs> 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 and he's like, he's he's caught babies before, you know, he's just so cute. So we just we're just like, he's there. And his name is so reflective of exactly what you're describing. Just that primal innate wisdom. For me, his name represents being an able lion. Like his middle name is Abel. So it's Leon Abel. And Abel means breath of God or breath on so many levels that was speaking to me in that time where I was short of breath with the hypertension, truly just before he came out, there was this <gasps> gasp from me. Mm -hmm. I, I pushed and then I, <gasps> and then there was this vortex sound and it was like this vacuum he was coming from. And it was the breath that came from me. It just was like, we were all connected and and able means breath. And I had a friend who had spoken to me during this past year. And she said that Yahweh is actually best said. I might, I might butcher it, but it's best said. <sighs> Isn't that amazing? Like yeah. an inhale and an exhale is how they say Yahweh. Yahweh. So even in our daily breath, inhale and exhale, we're speaking the name of God. Like we're connected to God. Mm -hmm. And so in a religion that I grew up in, I felt like so much separated me from God, but truly our very, from our very first breath, we we're connected to God. It's just amazing. We, so he was born like that, like the, whoo, the vortex. Wow. It just is wild. So it was wild. So wild. Mm -hmm. And I just remember the first time that I held him and I was like, oh, my little evil lion. And then the nurse came in and she was like, you didn't want me in here, did you? <laughs> I love her. Oh, isn't she amazing? <laughs> I love her. What a beautiful birth story. What beautiful stories, plural. Kristen, I am just so thankful for spending this evening with you and getting to know you and hearing your birth stories. And I just, I could talk to you all night. Okay, Kristen, well, what I do at the end of every podcast is I ask every mom, what their favorite baby product is. And you've had seven babies. And so we really trust you. So can you share with us what your favorite baby product is? Sure. Around my third baby, I was in Norway and he was only a few months old. And my friend, who's a midwife, brought out this little bouncer. It was just made of fabric and a little frame. And we put my son in there and he kicked his little feet and he went straight to sleep and I was able to eat my food. <laughs> so that made me really happy. And I thought, I just, I have to have one of these for my next baby if we have another one. 
So we found it. It's just the Baby Bjorn Bouncer. I've seen them a lot more in the States now. And yeah, it helps mama eat her food. It helps the baby. It's like the perfect position for the baby's tummy if they're a little bit colicky because it elevates the baby just enough. I'm all for wearing him in my other babies, um, but sometimes mama needs a break and there's no shame in that. I just love the Baby Bjorn Bouncer. We will link to it in the show notes. And I also wanted to just share with everyone that Charlotte, North Carolina is an amazing place to be. So if you're visiting and you come to the Whitewater Center or to come to check out our MLS team that we're getting next year, or maybe you're scouting colleges like Davidson College, please stop by Abode, which is in downtown Davidson, and come and meet Kristen. And if you are listening to this podcast anywhere around the country, around the world, and you have questions for Kristen about fertility and massage and the body work that she does, and maybe you want to plan a trip in the middle of this pandemic to come see Kristen and help her heal something that is going on within you, then Kristen, please tell us how everybody can get a hold of you on social media to plan that trip. Sure. I would be honored to, to work with anyone who's listening. So we're in Davidson, North Carolina, which is really wonderful, like Heidi said, to visit. There's so many great eateries, renowned chefs that are known all around the United States. It's just amazing. But how you can find me is on Instagram, Abode Wellness Lounge. You can email me at abodedavidson at gmail.com. And then Kristen Renee is my Instagram handle. Okay, Kristen, thank you so much for everything. And one last question. This video went viral and we're going to link to it again on both of our Instagrams so that everyone who's listening could watch it again. But what did it feel like to go viral? Since it was this birth that I had felt so defeated from the very beginning and then to see that going so deep resonated with so many women on YouTube and on Instagram, it's been viewed over half a million times. It's pushing a million. It was incredibly humbling, to be honest, because the kind of messages I was getting was that I was brave and that I was amazing. And I think what, what women were realizing is that they, had, they were seeing something in me that they recognized in themselves. And what an amazing feeling to be able to mirror that in other sisters around the world. It was just And it is every day so humbling whenever I get these messages saying, I was afraid to give birth. I'm afraid during the pandemic, I'm going to be alone without my mom, without my sister. And I had viewed them there this whole time. And because I saw you unafraid giving birth, I feel like I can do this now. And like I said, it's just so humbling. And I'm just so deeply honored and so honored to share this story of Leon's birth with you, Heidi. Thank you so much. All right. Don't forget to head over to useanja.com. That's U-S-E-A-N-J-A.com and use code BIRTHSTORY for $100 off when you choose Cord Blood Banking privately with Use Anja. Thanks for listening to this week's episode and we will see you next week. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy to speak up, plan and